மறக்காம சர்பிரைஸ் பண்ணுங்க தேங்க் யூ So we're going to start off with the examination of this move knight to f6 in the in the Karakan. As I said this is my secondary option an option that I've shown many of my students very easy to play. Let's get right into the details here. Now almost always white will take this knight. Really hard to come up with another option. Uh for example like knight c3 retreating just allows black to develop bishop f5. Again nothing really makes sense. The most popular option is knight g3 here. After which um black can just maybe develop normally with g6 but a very enterprising and effective idea is to play h5 here or already threatening h4 and kicking the knight all over the board and if white goes h4 himself which blocks our h pawn advance then after bishop g4 we have a nice little outpost here and now it's very simple to develop with knight d7 e6 already black is better in my opinion here starting to take over the initiative so of course white really should take on f6 here this will be played in 99.9% of your games after which we will play e takes f6 and as i've already mentioned in the introduction to this section the whole idea here is that we get double pawns which um can be a negative but uh in return we have very simple development for all our pieces our pieces are and rooks will se seamlessly find good squares the queen will find the square in c7 and we'll look at some examples where we can just showcase how black's play is very very simple. So again, this is a variation that's very very easy to memorize. Uh, it gives um very straightforward, easy to follow plans. So as I mentioned another this another purpose of this variation can be that you may want to use it in a faster game, a rapid game where you can just get your pieces out quickly while your opponent burns time trying to figure out how to deal with this. But um I'm also going to showcase a couple of methods here for black. where we're actually going to strive for more than just develop our pieces and see what happens but we're actually going to play for the initiative and try to take over the game. Now as I've already mentioned this variation we obviously get these double pawns which are going to be quite which could be quite an issue if we get to a, for example a pawn end game that would be probably one of the worst things that can happen is because uh this is going it's what is known as a crippled majority where we have a 4 on 3 the problem is these four pawns cannot create a pass pawn against the uh those three pawns meanwhile white's pawn majority here is going to uh it's a 4 on 3 that could be converted to a pass pawn with c4 d5 so again some trade offs here uh this line is considered objectively to be a little better for white but as you will see here it's like to be very very effective especially if you're not playing a particularly strong you know master level opponent who or who will be a a very knowledgeable in exploiting all these tiny positional details and i should mention this variation is not some hole in the wall uh cl club level weapon uh, that that's only accessible or that's only usable at the level of under 1500 or anything like that this is a weapon that many title players have used as i mentioned the world champion himself has played this way in one so anyway let's get into some moves here now uh the first move we look at is knight f3 it's a very simple option just develop the knight it's also the most popular move in the practice of my students when you who uh, as i said are rated between 1500 and uh, 1800 this is the very shy primarily shows them and um most of the, their games have went this way however this move is a little bit of an inaccuracy uh but uh whatever it looks natural enough so uh let's have a look what goes on here so bishop d6 is very natural getting ready to castle uh king side and once again there's not really a lot to memorize here we know where the pieces have to go but i will still want i still would like to demonstrate some active ideas for black that are valid so so bishop d3 castles castles and now black plays this move rook e8 now the order of the move doesn't really matter like i said uh the important thing is we know this bishop goes on d6 the bishop on c8 will almost always go to e6 the knight on b8 will go to d7 and um then the queen can slide over to c7 to link the rooks but there are also some alternate alternate alternative setups to the one that i just described and we're going to see um uh, just that in this example. So black plays the immediate rook e8 and now white plays h3 to stop this bishop from potentially going to g4. It was also possible to play a bishop g4 here, but black uh, sticks with the standard setup rook e8 h3 and now knight d7 bishop e3. Okay, so as you notice black has left this bishop at home on c8 for now. Of course it can come to e6 later as I've already mentioned. The move order here is not particularly relevant. So black plays now a very important move knight of fate. Of course getting ready for this bishop to come out, but another reason for behind this move knight of fate is that the knight will actually continue on its journey. And um 
what this knight can do in a fate, first of all, once the bishop comes out and the queen comes out and the rook comes to d8, the knight is not going to be blocking the rooks, which will be shooting down these open files. And furthermore, as I've already alluded to, the knight is not stopping on a fate. In fact, they continue going to g6 in order to sort of cement this this uh, this king side. And later on, it can also go to f4, and we will the next game we look at will be just that. And we can see how um, unpleasant for white that that knight's presence can really be. So. Getting back to the position of hand after this move knight f8, white continues with a very, very natural move c4. Again, he's trying to use his pawn majority here, and he's grabbing some space in the center, so this is a plan we'll see quite often. Rook c1 follows, uh, sorry, bishop e6 follows, then rook c1. Of course, bishop e6 is part of our setup. Get the bishop out. Now, I've already alluded to the main plan being queen c7 and rook d8, and uh, all the pieces are in the game. But here, black takes notes of the... Uh, intricacies of the position and varies that plan by playing queen to d7. Now what's that all about? As I've mentioned, the queen usually goes to c7 because this knight is on d7, but because black has gotten this knight out of the way early and plays queen d7, now he figures, okay, I can go queen c7 and aim down this diagonal, but there's really no target. Whereas on d7, I have a pretty good eye on this pawn on h3, maybe I'll even consider sacrificing there. Now, in this game, which is played between pretty decent players, uh, the black player here was um, rated at 2200, and the player playing white was around 2000, 2100. So a game between a master and an expert, white completely underestimated this danger here and played the move queen to c2, creating his own battery. However, the difference is, this battery really isn't uh, effective at all. Meanwhile, black's battery here is aimed directly at the king, and black said, whoa, you don't believe this? Okay, let me go bishop takes h3. Now, white is basically forced to accept this, otherwise he's just down a pawn. Pawn takes, and now queen h3. And it turns out that it's uh, quite scary for white here, because this queen and this bishop are combining quite well. This knight is immobilized because of made on h2. So, white really found nothing better than to retreat his queen all the way back to d1, and just lose that tempo and bolster this knight. So, obviously, black here has tremendous compensation. Two pawns, and attack, but it's, the, it's not the problem for... for what is that? It's not just compensation, it's a winning advantage here. Now, Black played this nice idea of f5, which will ex which I will explain, but it could have been possible to play the simple knight to g6, and now this knight is starting to come to h4, after which uh, this knight on f3 will be deflected, which leads to mate. And if bishop g6 and h takes g6, and we get this pretty amusing uh, block of pawns, White is actually powerless to stop the idea of rook e4 and rook g4, swinging in another piece to deliver the final blow. But the idea of f5 was actually quite similar to uh, the idea of rook e4, rook g4, because after the move rook to e1, black skillfully played rook e6, and now the rook is ready to play rook to g6, and now we can see why f5 is necessary to block this bishop's diagonal. So uh, at this point, it was just uh, over for white, after he played knight to g5, rook g6, actually white just resigned here. This king is a complete uh, ruins with all of black pieces getting next near it. And uh, now there's so many threats. I mean, the simplest one is h6, just to win the piece back. But there may also be ideas of, uh, let's say, if random move for white, rook takes g5. And then, of course, the idea here is to deflect the bishop from protection of f2. After which we get this very standard queen bishop combo mate. So a uh, very very convincing, quick, surprising win for Black in this variation. It's known to be quite unassuming, solid, just get our pieces out type of flow. But actually, again, going back here as a quick recap, knight f3, Black just goes with the program. Bishop d6 castles. He plays rook e8. Again, we discussed the move orders here are plenty. You can go bishop e6. You can go bishop g4 even. Uh, although I do like sticking with this straightforward bishop e6, knight d7, and f8 plan. Regardless, black goes rook e8. White plays h3, very natural, stopping bishop g4. Knight d7, knight f8. And now this very, very nice idea, queen to d7, angling at this h3 pawn. Of course, if white takes care against the sacrifice, black can just continue with rook d8 and knight g6, knight f4. We will actually see these ideas right now in our next example. And... In the game, White completely, completely overlooked the dangers and played Queen C2, allowing us this gorgeous uh, attack. So, pretty surprising, but also a pretty good argument for this system here. Now, let us go back to this position after Knight F3, and we'll look at a second game here. This game was actually played by one of my students, who was rated uh, rough, roughly 1700, against another player who was also rated 1700. 
and uh, this was actually uh, this student's first time playing the system. And here's how the game proceeded. So white played this again, this move, knight f3. Now black played bishop e6. Again, a little unusual to play the bishop there this early. I would advise to delay this for a bit because the bishop may also go to g4. But again, nothing inherently wrong with this setup. Bishop d3 followed, bishop d6. The bishops come out to their rightful posts. White played castles, castles, and rook e1. So I'm of the opinion here that the uh, player playing white, while not making any mistakes so far, uh, far from it, uh, was not completely familiar with the system and just was playing natural moves. And I've seen this, again, in, in several of my students' games, and I'm expecting this trend to continue in your games, uh, if you play similar opposition, is that players playing the white pieces are not really going to know uh, any detailed specifics here. They're just going to try to play some natural stuff. So 97 followed, again, getting all the pieces out to normal squares. Now came a move from white already in the wrong direction, the move queen to e2. A little bit unusual to put this queen on the e-file, and after the move rook to e8, already setting up some e-file uh, x-ray shots with the rook against the queen. Already not a fan of the decision for white. And white began digging a little bit of a hole here with this move queen e4, so going for a checkmate, but easily parried by our, by our normal uh, standard maneuver, knight to f8. Now the pawn on h7 is completely well defended. Black is doing nothing wrong except uh, just following the normal development scheme. And white is just running around with the queen. And after the further queen e2, uh, this trend continued. Now black played the move queen to c7. So in the previous game we saw this move queen d7, which looks fine here as well. Here queen c7 was preferred, targeting this h2 pawn potentially. Uh, queen d7 is also fine, but of course we don't have the option of sacrificing here anymore. So queen c7 played, and now bishop e3 probably almost necessary in order to negate this extra. Already, I think black has a very, very nice, pleasant position. White has lost a bunch of time. Black is getting fully mobilized. And after rook to, rook to d8, all of black's pieces have been brought into play. Now white plays another standard uh, sort of move, h3. Again, nothing really concrete in mind, just playing these slight little natural-looking developing moves. But after h3, now we already know that this king side is becoming quite a bit of a target. So, black responded very well here with knight g6, and now this is what I alluded to in the previous uh, example. This knight has some quite good prospects aiming for uh, an attack on the king side here. So, white decided to play queen g2, get this queen out of a potential knight f4 jump, but knight f4 comes anyway. And this knight is, of course, very, very well placed on f4. Not only are some sacrifices being menaced against white's king, well, the knight is just an actively placed piece, which is exerting a lot of influence over the position. And at an opportunity, for example, in this position, I would not mind giving up this knight for the bishop and enjoying the two bishop advantage in the asymmetrical position with pawns on both flanks. The knight square bishop is going to become quite powerful here. White elected to save this bishop with bishop f1. Now, after bishop d5, already white had to contend with the uh, black playing the move knight takes h3. So, for example, rook d1, knight h3 will net a full pawn. Or, of course, the simple bishop takes f3 is also shattering white's structure. So, white was forced to admit this mistake and played the move bishop to e2, defending the, the, the knight. And now black played a very interesting move, f5. Now, my preference would have been to just snap this bishop off the board. After knight e2, say queen e2, lots of nice options here. f5, for example, trying to trap the bishop. Also, from a purely positional standpoint, an idea that we'll see in this game, uh, the simple move b5, which will lock down on more light squares and make sure that white can't really advance with his pawns to c4. Uh, that would have been a very effective way to continue. But the move f5 is also interesting and sets up a pretty nice trap, uh, simply being that, let's say, white plays a nothing move. Now the knight's going to take, and regardless of what white takes with, this move at 4 is trapping this bishop. And in the next game, we're really going to get acquainted with this idea of pushing these kingside pawns. Uh, so after this move at 5, white decided he can't tolerate this knight anymore. This bishop takes f4, of course allowing bishop takes f4. So black does end up getting, with, uh, end up, uh, getting the two bishops here, and, uh, and of course pushing white all over the board. Queen d1 was played, and now again, I like this move b5 as I've mentioned, uh, the simple idea is I prevent c4, grab some space on the queen side, and make sure this pawn majority isn't going anywhere. Mean in the meanwhile, uh, black's position is very no longer just better, but it's strongly pre preferable. Lots of simple plans here, for example, double up on the, uh, 
on the e file or double up on the d file and play c5 to blast open the position for the bishops. Uh, a more courageous and ambitious plan may at one point even involve the move g5, g g4, uh, but I think the other options are less uh, wild and, and uh, just as effective. But the game, a uh, very nice tactic was, uh, was was played. Queen d6, so ang angling to put pressure on this pawn on, on d4, so white responded with c4. And now queen g6. So an interesting idea, swinging this queen over to assist with um, this kingside pressure. And after c4, black just played bishop c4, maintaining the strong bishop pair. Of course, the bishops in the center are tremendously influential, pressing both sides of the board. And uh, the opening has worked very, very well for for um, for Black here. And after Bishop D3, well, the move that was played in the game was uh, returning the Queen to D6, which uh, led to actually a quick win. But in the previous, in, in this actual position, Black missed the chance to just wipe White off the board with a nice tactic. Rook takes D4, taking advantage of all of these pins. The pin on the D file here, and the pin against the Knight, of course, being the main feature because of made on G2. Uh, however, after the move that was played in the game, Queen d6, angling to pressure this pawn, Black was still better and ended up winning the game in just a few short four moves. So, um, quite an impressive game in my opinion uh, for giving this opening uh, a try for the first time. And let's go back here, another demonstration of this knight f3 move. Okay, well, Black played a slightly funny move order, but the ideas were all uh, the same as always. We get the bishops out, we get... Uh, the knight's going to d7, the rooks are ready to come in on e8 and d8. White sort of played, misplayed this with these endless queen moves, was forced to retreat, and I really want to stress this position here, as this is basically the goal setup. All the pieces find squares very easily, influential on the center, influential on the queen side, influential on the king side, and the only thing that we need to know here is once he gets this position, what plans can we undertake? Well, one of them, we saw this game, the move knight g6, knight f4. That's a very important plan. Even the move f5 that we witnessed in the game, and we will witness this idea even more in the next uh, game that I'm about to show, these kingside pawns that may become a weakness in the end game are uh, very, very useful in the middle game, not only for providing black's king with ample pawn cover, but also because these pawns can be actually advanced down the board. Uh, if you remember the variation we looked at in the pan off, in uh, the Panel of Lithuanic Attack, the first alternate weapon chapter, actually something similar there took place where these double pawns rushed up the board and uh, pushed um, White's pieces away. So now let us go back and look at our final game uh, that takes place in this variation, and after this, we'll be all set to play this. And now instead of looking at the move Knight F3, which I've mentioned in my students' games, the most popular move, quite a popular move in general, we'll have a look at a more informed move here. Uh, c3. And the idea of this move is that the knight is actually not going to go to f3, but rather is going to go to the square e2. Now there's uh, two reasons we're going to look at the following game. First of all, this is considered the best plan for white against this variation, so if you want to play this variation against stronger players, or if people start knowing you play this variation, and maybe prepare something for you, or in general, it's just good to know what to do against uh, the best options for your opponent. And um, the other reason that I want to have a look at this game is because it was just a fantastic game from Black's point of view to really show how Black can utilize these uh, these seemingly weak double pawns in the middle game to great effect. So let's have a look at this game here after C3. Now, uh, again, the move orders here don't matter too much, but I like just definitely not that move. Bishop D6, developing our king side first. There follows Bishop D3, castles, and now uh, Knight E2. This is the main uh, setup for white here. So there are two ideas behind this knight development. The first one is that the knight is more flexible in e2 than on f3, where it can be prone to the pins, where it can be prone to, uh, well, not prone, but rather it doesn't really have anywhere pro uh, any prospects to go forward. Whereas on e2, the knight does two things. First of all, it can swing over to g3 and f5, which is a very common idea. But also, it leaves this f pawn op open in some positions white wants to go f4 or 5 and really cramp down on, on our, our on our bishop, which will prevent it from going to um, e6. But the main idea here for white in this whole system is black was rook e8, and now white plays this move queen c2, which gives a black um, sort of choice how to defend the pawn in h7. Now the move that we're going to be looking at that was played in this game is uh, the move h6. And um, again, there's two options. So g6 looks very logical, just blunt this whole battery. 
But it weakens some dark squares here and also provides white a target for attack. And after the move h4, white is going to play h5. And some games have gone here knight d7, h5, knight f8, bishop h6. But white is really ready to castle here and he's already quite uh, fast with his attack, already putting pressure on, on black's um, kingside pawn structure. And okay, black will also get some play here. There's possible to play a five and blockade all the all this da the, this battery for good, and then try to go bishop e6 and start off his our own counterplay. But really, I feel like white's play is much easier. For example, even a five can be met by a timely g4, and we constantly need to be watching out for white doubling on the h file, white sacrificing something in h7, sacrificing something in g6. Um, it's possible to play this way, but quite dangerous and does require um, a bit of know-how. So h6 here really keeps in line with the with what I've been showing here. Just keep it simple. We want to play a game where not that's not based on memorizing all sorts of theory, but we have a setup in mind. We want to get our pieces out. We don't really want any trouble up until we get to the middle game where we're going to be the ones who are causing this trouble. So h6. Now this move h6 works very well against uh, this plan of long castling. So for example, um, bishop e3, knight d7 was played in this game. And of course, the king can now go into uh, both directions. Uh, the game, white played the move castle short, which is also probably the best option. If white plays the move long castles, then he doesn't have the same idea of playing h4, h5, attacking g6. Whereas getting a pawn to g5 is going to be uh, quite difficult. These doubled pawns here are giving very, very good defense and support to the black king. Meanwhile, black can start with playing moves like b5, and then b4 is on the cards, but even the simple knight b6... Or, or, sorry, even queen a5 first, and then knight b6, and then bishop b6. Basically, black's attack here is going to be faster than white's, and at the very, very least, no worse than white's. So, white is really advised to castle short here, and that is indeed what happened in this game. And now, black played the move knight to f8. So, following our usual recipe, the bishop is getting ready to, de uh, to get developed, and um, we'll go all according to plan. So, now white played the move rook f to e1 simply getting her pieces out. Queen c7 was played, now this is the usual spot for the queen, we get this um, battery going, and now knight g3. So a very nice multi-purpose move from white, blocking this attack to h2, and potentially wanting to swing the knight over to f5. That is one of the key ideas here, the knight on f5, we've seen how strong black knight is on f4, so the opposite is also true, if white gets the knight to f5 it will be intolerable and we will have to part with one of our bishops for it giving white another positional advantage. So that's a no-go. So instead, black plays the move bishop e6 here, taking advantage of the fact that knight f5 is not yet possible. White plays the very natural c4, and black plays rook to d8. We've already seen the setup in the previous game. Again, all the pieces are nice and, uh, and well-placed, and perfect harmony in black's camp. However, this game is not about this initial setup, it's about what's happening next. And the rest of this game is extremely instructive. And I should also mention the ratings of the players playing black. I believe it was an international master and a women's grandmaster rated 24-20 uh, FIDE. So a very strong player and uh, that was playing black. And playing white was also a 23-50, I believe, woman grandmaster uh, opponent. So a game between two titled strong players. And, um, well, very, very instructive what happens next. Both of them play good moves, but it turns out only one can emerge on top. So A3 was played in this game. Uh, logical, white may be planning b4 to expand these pawns, and now black plays a very nice move. Bishop to c8. So bishops are long range pieces, they're perfectly happy on the back rank, even on c8 the bishop has tremendous influence. So the point of bishop c8 is it's, it's sort of 2 in 1. The main point is just to open up this rook on e8 to target um, the e-file, but a side point is that black is also sort of waiting here. Black is waiting to say, okay, what is white going to do? What is, he, is his next move and how can I react accordingly? And how, how does this look? Well, in the game, that turned out to pay off immediately when white plays rook to d1. Very natural move, getting the rook to the center, of course. But now, remember the what I just said? Black is saying, look, I want, I'm going to play a slightly improving move. I want to see what white's up to. White goes rook d1. Black immediately strikes back. Bishop g4. Definitely a hard move for white to spot. Bishop just went back. Now it's going all the way forward. Uh, but what's the point here? Well, first of all, it's a little bit disruptive for white's rook. So white decided to just play rook to c1, but now comes the main idea of this whole of this whole maneuver, h5. Getting these kingside pawns rolling. Immediately h4 is a, is a, is a potential threat, 
Doesn't win a pawn just yet, let's assume like b4 is played. h4 and knight f1, and now h3 is going to really start damaging white's king size structure. We're actually going to see something similar in the game. Now, white here, again, sort of was at a loss of what to do. As we, Again, this was a game between two uh, very strong players. And the game we looked at before, that was my student's game, was a game between two 1700s. But I was very surprised to see how confused White got in this structure, in this position, where Black suddenly started showing this ag aggression. So White played Bishop at 5, and now Black plays G6, and White just goes back to D3. And I was just shocked to see this. Uh, White really should take this Bishop on G4 at this point to prevent H4. But after the obvious H takes G4, these pawns are really creating quite an impression. For example, Black's next move is very likely just F5. And now f f4 is on the cards. So still, this was probably the way to go because after bishop to d3, this just gave Black an extra move to fulfill all her hopes and dreams. H4 follows. Knight has to go to f1. Now h3 follows. So again, the king side pawn structure is absolutely getting obliterated. And after g3 comes another very aesthetic move, in my opinion, f5. So just look at this structure here. This is a. I'll make it a different color. This is, uh, was very, very beautiful, this light square setup. Again, the Karakhan uh, at the heart of it, c6, d5, the first two moves, that's a light square strategy. In this game, Black is playing this light square strategy to perfection. Um, these pawns are clearly a strength, not a weakness, and they're, they're aiming to just keep going forward. This pawn wants to definitely go to f4 and cause some more weaknesses in White's camp. So actually, in this position, White was felt obliged to play the move f4 herself, but the thing that's going on here now is that with these pawns all in dark squares here, even more light square holes are apparent here. And now black just starts playing phenomenal chess. Bishop e7. So the bishop on d6 no longer exerting uh, influence on this diagonal as much as it was the move before. Bishop goes to e7, rerouting itself to f6, new target on the long diagonal. Uh, white plays knight to d2, bishop f6, knight b3. So white is just in time to defend this pawn, but black is, is absolutely elated with the current happenings because the knight is obviously not doing anything on b3 than defending these pawns. Meanwhile, the light square strategy is in full effect. All the pieces are active. White, uh, black plays b6, so potentially flirting with ideas of c5. White decides to go queen f2 to bolster the pawn. Now queen goes to d7. Another idea of b6, of course, was to potentially stop this knight from moving forward anywhere. Queen goes to d7, adding some extra pressure to d4. White is really struggling to come up with a plan. White decides to try to exchange his bishop on e4, but loses control of the e4 square, which allows black to play rook to e4. And now, okay, again, I'm going to highlight these light squares, making quite a strong impression on me here. White trades his bishop off, but does not really help his uh, herself fight for the light squares. Black still is, uh, is the absolute king of light squares here. After rook d1, queen f5, what black is just continuing with the strategy. And we can go for the finish here. Bishop c1, trades, trades, queen infiltrates on the light square on d3. White is losing material after rook e3, queen takes c4. Just for complete mistake, rook c3, queen d5. Now all of white's pieces are paralyzed, defending against these threads. d4 is hanging, c5 is a potential threat, and black is up a pawn. Bishop e3, and now knight e6. The knight finally emerges from f8. Comes to a light square, very fittingly, and is very close to delivering the final blow. Pawn on d4 is just impossible to hold. Queen c2 was played, c5 taking advantage of the pin. Uh, just pure agony, but beautiful play from, from black. The finish was captures, captures, pawn captures, pawn captures. c4, queen f3, again, everything's on the light squares, and at this point, white threw in the towel. Of course, the bishop 23 is hanging, rook d1 is hanging, everything is hanging. Black uh, is up a ton of material. Just an absolutely beautiful game. Probably the best game that I've seen when I was doing my research for uh, this variation. And definitely a perfect, perfect, perfect example here of how to handle this position with black. So once again, this was about dealing with two things. First of all, we looked at the option of c3 for white here, going for this um, critical setup with uh, knight to e2 and queen to c2. My recommendation is the simple h6. Uh, with the idea that now if white wants to castle along, then he's going to have to uh, deal with this pawn storm, whereas our pawns here are going to be quite a defensive formation. So white is uh, definitely is, um, it's recommended to castle short, after which we follow the normal setup as was played in this game, and uh, 
Okay, we already have the highlights here. And now the beautiful, beautiful idea from Black here, again, worth mentioning. This bishop c8, bishop g4 move very, very high level. And now h5. And once these pawns got rolling um, after white's uh, inaccuracies, the position that was reached here was just absolutely dominant. These light squares uh, were absolutely blacks. And, uh, yeah, of course, um, this game is attached, as well as another opponent's game in the PGNs that will, again, be on the same theme. And uh, it's insanely impressive examples by uh, master players in this variation how to handle this. So, again, this is the Tartakauer variation. It is uh, definitely a weapon that you can use uh, depending on your opposition and depending on the time control. And you can just wield this out from time to time against almost anyone. Like I said, this game was between two titled players. And, uh, yeah, of course, we you know, we know the, the setup, the bishops coming out, the queen coming out, the knight coming out, the rooks coming out. Very, very nice harmonious setup followed by bringing the knight to f8 and then potentially f4, or we can also start to use these pawns to advance down the board. So I hope you really like this chapter presentation. You can use these ideas in your games. Like I said, I have no quarrels at all showing these lines to my students, and I greatly enjoy when they're able to use this with success and win very nice games like the one I showed in this presentation, and hopefully your experiences will be very, very similar. <laughs>